Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this A Think In with Gavin Patterson, the President and Chief Revenue Officer of Salesforce. Um, just as we were talking before we got on, we were talking about Salesforce's own version of A Think In, uh, otherwise known as Dreamforce. Um, we've got a little to aspire to, Gavin, because I think you said that they, it had 100 million uh, streams last week. Is that right? Something like that? Uh, yes, it did. Good morning. Um... Well, small things, great things happen. So we're going to start <laughs> st st start with this. But but uh, um, when we spoke uh, a little last week ahead of this, I, I, I suppose a, a couple of things came from it. And I just wanted to share those with everyone before we got started. One was that I spoke to Gavin the morning after the Slack deal had completed. So it was another a uh, long night for you. I imagine the business of being based here and working with a San Francisco based company means there's a fair, fair bit of that. But, but it was a moment for when I in speaking to you where I for the first time fessed up fully how little I understood what is one of the world's great tech nations, Salesforce, and the deal with Slack had sort of made it more real for me, all of us have taught us use Slack. And then the other thing was, was also, I think, said to you that what we're trying to do here with these conversations with business leaders is do what we don't see happen anywhere, which is that we all pay lip service to the idea that companies are reshaping the way we, we work, but we still devote just hours and hours and acres and acres of newsprint to the interviews of politicians. And we don't really spend time with the people who run businesses a, to understand how those businesses work, and B, then to try and examine some of the choices that you know people like you face. And so I hope in the course of the hour, we'll get a chance to really dig in, understand Salesforce, but also then try and think a little through the digital economy and the UK's place in it. So Gavin, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Um, a, a, um, a thinking, as you know, is sort of a mix between a Kind of editorial meeting and a town hall so we want everyone to weigh in either their experience of salesforce or you know their questions about digital skills the future of the economy so please do they will they will make their points uh, either in the chat or putting their digital hand up and i'll bring people into the into the conversation um but l l l let, me, let me start a little bit i'm gonna, I'm gonna sound i'm afraid a little bit like the queen here so so what exactly is it that you do what, what does fair sales salesforce do exactly well it's probably um i would say the most successful silicon valley company that nobody's ever heard of um and why would i say that it's 21 years old um it has grown at uh 20% uh, a year on a revenue basis um, for that time, uh, which is a pretty remarkable achievement. Very, very few companies have, have, have achieved that. Um, what is it? Um, I think one of the reasons people don't know much about it is it is, it is a B2B business. Um, so it's not front and center in, in, in many consumers' lives, it, 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 but it, it underpins a lot of what consumers do. So the business uh, back in 99 um, started and indeed coined the term CRM, uh, Customer Relationship Marketing. Uh, and its first product was um, uh, what is now Sales Cloud. It is, it's a way of managing a sales pipeline for uh, business to business customers. Uh, and that is probably the product it's most well known for even today. Um, and has uh, an extraordinary market share of, uh, of that market. So I think 80% of the Fortune 500, for example, use Salesforce CRM to manage their B2B business. And, and Gavin, can you just give us an example, like a concrete example? So what does a, a company buys the Salesforce product to do its quote unquote CRM, its customer relationship marketing? What, what actually does that do? Well, first, it's... Um, it's software in the cloud. That was the other innovation that uh, Mark brought. So uh, until in the 1990s, software sat on people's computers, um, sometimes in people's on hardware, um, on servers or on mainframes, but it, it didn't sit in the cloud itself. But that was the other innovation uh, that um, Mark brought to the market. Um, in terms of what that software does, and it's, it's a subscription in many, rather than a, a, a license per se, is it allows you to manage 
um, sales opportunities. So if you are uh, interacting with a customer and you're collecting data on them and you're trying to close a sale, how do you manage all the information and insight around that so that anybody who's involved in that deal can see what's going on um, and can manage that opportunity as it goes from you know, conception through to execution. Um, so it's a way of aligning resources behind yeah. a customer on a sales opportunity. That's, that's the, the core product. So forgive me, this is going to be oversimplistic, but if I was a car manufacturer and I had a supplier, or perhaps more importantly, I was the supplier and I was working to a car manufacturer, I would be able to follow what they bought, when they bought it, what what the opportunities of their next you know production line might be. Is that is that the kind of thing when you say say business to business? Yes. To um, okay. But it's expanded a lot since then. Um, so it is now um, both B two B and B two C. So you can you can manage that on uh, for both consumers and business. Um, it's marketing. So in terms of creating a bespoke marketing journey, marketing message for one of your customers, you, you can do that. Drawing on data from multiple different sources. Um, for commerce, uh, it's the second biggest supplier of uh, e-commerce software in the world. Um, analytics, it's number one in analytics um, with a, a product called Tableau, which allows you to analyze and, and visualize data uh, in many ways. Um, what else? And then, and then, and then Gavin, what service is the other one? Yes. And then, and then will, you, will you tell us a bit about culturally how different it is? Because obviously you move from being chief executive of BT, a, a company that's still to, to some extent is not living in the cloud. It has quite a lot of, you know, what you might even think of as a sort of industrial role, you know, b building lines, maintaining lines, and, and a lot of, you know, retail customers. Uh, they're very different businesses, obviously, but I'm really interested in the difference culturally between a San Francisco-based tech company and a former, you know, British national utility that moved into the private sector. What, what are the differences culturally that you see so far? <laughs> As you can imagine, they're, they're very different uh, businesses. And uh, I think it'd be wrong, or probably unfair of me to say one is better than the other. They're just different, yeah. uh, would be a, a polite way of putting it. So look, Salesforce is, it feels and operates like a small business still. Um, so it is, uh, it's functionally organized. Um, uh, it's, there's probably 10 people um, that are probably the key decision makers across the business. There are no legacy systems. There are no pension issues to resolve. Um, the product development all comes through the same uh, IT stack. Um, you know, it's a very young company. So about to give you a sense, I would say it's sort of replenishing a third of its people every year. Because uh, it's, I mean, one of the biggest challenges I face is, is actually having to hire 20% net new people a year. Um, so it's, um, it's, you know, it's, it's very different in that sense. And then so, everything's real time, James. That's the other, only other thing I would say. So you, in, uh, in most businesses, and BT is no different, um, you are, if you're preparing for a board presentation, it's probably taking two or three months of PowerPoint uh, refinement before you present a, board, a paper to the board and there's some discussion about it. And then if you're lucky, a decision gets made. In Salesforce, you're, there's very little preparing of, of papers per se. Um, you're essentially looking at real-time data um, and AI produced um, predictions and trying to drive a car is more the analogy of it. So it op operates in real time um, and uh, you have to be able to respond to that. You have to be able to think on your feet. You have to have a point of view, um, and you have to be able to debate. And, so, and when you say just, just can I just pick up on one thing, Gavin? When you say you're you're, you're adding twenty percent new employees, currently there, how many employees does Salesforce have now? Fifty-four thousand. So you're so so you are trying to bring in some ten thousand new people into the company each year. Is that is that globally, including the US? Yeah, it's it's more than that because people leave, um, and um, 
so and and people you know there's a performance management culture so some people don't make it so in reality you're probably trying to bring in 30 percent more people accepting you know that people are going to leave so you've got that's, that's really interesting you've got 10 people who really run it you've got about fifty four thousand people working f uh, for it can i just go back to the point you made about a company that grow grows revenue right for 20 odd years now i think you know market capitalization values but it's worth what a couple of hundred billion dollars say salesforce i think it's some, somewhere around there is it what 250 yeah so 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 the question i've got is also what does that tell you about the culture of listed companies in the uk versus the us in that it seems to me as though in the uk we prize profit ebit whatever you call it the, the cash returned particularly to investors particularly to pension funds mm. the us you're saying that's 20 years of of revenue growth do, do you think there's a different attitude to growth versus return on different sides of the atlantic um it's a good question uh i think it's if i look at the valuations um certainly if you're in a growth market or in a, or in a growth business you're probably better listing in the us than you are in the uk um, and I think that's because there are more comparable companies. Um, the investment community is a little bit more geared up to understanding the levers of growth. Um, uh, there's probably a better access to, to capital, better access to talent. Um, there aren't many what I would call true growth companies listed in the UK. No. They're not in that in that sense, and then and then Gavin, just one other thing about the sort of the cultural uh, point, the the way the company communicates. Right, I know I said to you, you know, that you know, Dreamforce is a you know is a is a competitor to the thinking. The truth is that there's nothing really like Dreamforce. You know, James Corden kicks it off. Metallica's a regular feature, but the extent to which Mark Benioff has this moment where he talks to, uh, you know, not just Salesforce employees, but most importantly, I suppose, Salesforce's customers. You know, it, it's reminiscent of obviously of Steve Jobs and and probably less so he'd like the comparison to Steve Ballmer, but it's the it's that same idea of the company as the and the chief executive as the sort of showman entrepreneur. What, what, how does that translate inside the business? Well, I, it is the most important speech of the year um, that Mark gives. Uh, he spends a lot of time preparing for it. Um, typically, it's part of a week-long conference um, in San Francisco that um, is the biggest tech conference in the world. Um, 200, 250,000 people go to it which in San Francisco, a city of 700,000 people, you can imagine, uh, <laughs> swamps it to a, to, to yeah. a little bit. Um, and it's, it's very much billed as sort of Mark and the company's view of how technology is changing the way we work and live, et cetera. Uh, a lot of the new products are announced in Dreamforce, but it is part of the sales cycle of, of closing business. So one of the challenges this year has been <laughs> You know, this is a company that's um, been built on face-to-face -face selling. And, you know, even though it's a, it's been born in a digital age, it's, you know, the enterprise software market is is very much a face-to-face -face selling environment. Well, that's what we thought until this year, um, and we're having a very good year. Um, you know, uh, last two quarters have been strong. Pipeline looks very good, um, and yet nobody's meeting face-to-face. Right. Um, it's all over video and in, in some ways actually you know we're getting twice as much contact with decision makers over video as we would get face to face so it, it's forced not just us but everybody to reinvent and, and challenge some of the you know the accepted wisdom of, of how to do business well there's there's a, there's a great moment in this year in this year and, and and if you're new to sort of studying salesforce which as you can see i am um, it's really worth watching um, Mark Benioff's presentation. 
Partly actually, Gavin, I thought I thought the style of it, the way he communicated, um, actually, and I want to come back to this in a bit, the, the way in which he set out not the Salesforce company, but the Salesforce economy, the number of different people and businesses it touches was really interesting. Um, but obviously, the sort of the big reveal this year was was human. It was the moment having just sealed that deal with Slack that Stuart Butterfield sort of walked on and they kept each other sort of 10 feet apart, but set out. It was a very, it was a sort of, yes, it was a sort of like a socially distanced wedding where even the, the grooms were, were keeping their distance. Um, but but I see that Ross Shanks actually had asked a question about it or made a made a point as much. I'm going to bring Ross in if I, if I might. Ross, Ross, are you there? Because- I am, I there you are. Where are you? Um, Russell, did you spell out the point you were making, because it seems to be about moving beyond cloud computing and into some of the tech space world where Salesforce may see a different kind of competition. Yeah, it feels like so if Salesforce invented the CRM category um, and has been as you know, largely left alone from strong competitive forces, I know there's, there are competitors out there. But it feels like the acquisition of Slack puts it on a collision course with big tech. And I know Salesforce is big tech, but um, specifically Microsoft and no doubt uh, further acquisitions will put it on a collision course with other big tech. And I think presumably speaks to an ambition beyond its roots. So my question is, how does, well, what is the new vision for Salesforce and how does the Slack acquisition uh, support that vision? Gavin. Sure. Um, well, Salesforce to date has all has been about, I guess, what we'd call the customer 360. So um, it's a sort of single view of the customer, a single source of truth um, that you that's based on scraping data from multiple sources, um, and that allows you to sell, do you know, sales, service, marketing, commerce, analytics, um, field service. So it's it is how do you create a richer customer? Uh, identity and um, that improves your ability to market and sell um, and service. What Slack brings to the party is, you know, it's a new way. It's probably the the most developed way of collaborating, of of working. Um, in some ways, a, a sort of an operating system for collaboration, if you like. So it allows you to manage that customer three hundred and sixty, solve the problems, deliver the sales by working on it collaboratively. Um, through, through the Slack um, interface. So you put the two things together. Um, uh, I would say that we, we haven't uh, uh, had a, an easy run in terms of, of technology, Rossa. I mean, it's, um, you know, it is, uh, it's a very competitive market. Microsoft have been in the market in many aspects today. Um, so their Dynamics product, for example, competes in CRM um, for... Uh, uh, is one example of that. What is true is that acquiring um, Slack does put us more um, front and center uh, in terms of competition with Teams. Um, uh, but it isn't, uh, it's not an act of aggression on Microsoft. It is, it's, it's the way to think about it is how do we continue to stay relevant to our customers by giving them the very best way of collaborating and and, and working, um, anybody who uses Slack will tell you it is, it's an extraordinary product. Um, you know, it's people are religious about it. Um, and what, what'll be very interesting, I think for Salesforce is the founders of, of, of Slack came out of the gaming market originally, um, as you probably know. And, and in fact, they had two failed gaming uh, startups with a, um, a, uh, a, a photo sharing service uh, called, um, uh, um, I've suddenly forgot it, uh, Flickr uh, in between, which was sold to Yahoo. Um, they bring uh, great skills in terms of developing, uh, in terms of how to create products that are very easy to use and very intuitive. And I think that that is going to make a difference, not just to the collaborative part of the equation, but I think all the products and services will benefit from that. Um, and uh, so it, it's going to be a very interesting period for us, a very exciting period, I think. I, I think um, I a number of people who want to talk a little more about Slack and how it works. Can, can I just pick up on Ross's point? Because, you know, those people call sort of 
remember their Silicon Valley law, will remember the way in which Larry Ellison of Oracle and Bill Gates at Microsoft were for years head to head. And I don't know if you remember, Gavin, those periods when, you know, stock price of Oracle moved a little bit. And then for a brief few days, you know, Larry Ellison would be wealthier than Bill Gates, then Gates would return to being the wealthiest man in the world. But underlying it, there was a very fundamental competition between Oracle and between Microsoft. Mark Benioff obviously came out of Oracle and many people look at Salesforce as sort of Oracle 2.0, the next generation of management of that kind of data. The Slack deal to some people does put Salesforce, exactly to Ross's point, back into head-to-head -head competition with a, with a technology giant. And I wonder whether it feels like that from where you sit. I, I'm not sure I'd characterize it quite that way. Um, you know, it isn't, it isn't, as I say, it's not meant to sort of be a declaration of war on, on Microsoft. Um, you know, it is, I think, a way of ensuring that our proposition around CRM um, and, and the customer 360, that, that actually people who use it, be it employees, be it partners, um, you know, the whole... Uh, system around it. So there are 240, sorry, 2,400 different applications that are connected into uh, Slack, including obviously all of the, the Salesforce clouds, you know, are able to, you know, do a better job of serving customers. I mean, it's, it isn't, I know it sort of likes to be, people like to characterize these things as sort of uh, a battle of the giants and very, um, and very personal. Um, I'm sure competition does add a certain element to it, but here's something you probably don't know, you know, as you, uh, Mark came out of Oracle, um, one of his first investors was, was um, Larry Ellison. Oh, really? And that, that model is quite common in Silicon Valley. People come out of the big firms um, and the firms invest in them. Um, you know, no. you, you see that a lot in Salesforce. So Salesforce have, um, a thriving ventures business, um, I think around a hundred different investments, uh, where they take a stake in, you know, startups um, generally um, that are built around the Salesforce platform because it's an open platform, um, as you were talking about earlier. There are a lot of businesses that, you know, have grown up and thrive by working um, on the platform itself, um, and then they go off to do different things. So. You know, Snowflake, which is the current darling of uh, uh, of uh, the valley, is you know Salesforce have a significant stake in that. Um, and Chino, who is uh, an IPO in the last quarter, uh, Salesforce made over almost a billion dollars uh, on that um, investment alone. So, um, so you, you you see this, you know, entrepreneurism is encouraged when somebody leaves a business, they're not cut off from it. Uh, they're, they're back. They, they, they hedge their bets, they take a stake in it. Well, well, well the, uh, I want to talk a bit about that in a moment, but I just want to stick, can we, if we can, Gavin, for, on Slack for a few moments, mm -hmm. not least because, I, I think partly because so many of us use it, um, there are lots of people who've got, got views on it. I'd, I'd like to come back to that Salesforce economy and, and the and the model of the um, West Coast uh, economy. But I wanted to bring in, if I could, Ramsey Sargent, who, who's got points about how Slack is gonna sort of expose Salesforce to scrutiny. And my colleagues, Lister Mir, who's got views about how we can make uh, Slack better. And my colleague, Tess Murray too. So I'm gonna let them all sort of come at you at once. Um, Ramsey, are you there? Yes. Okay, hello, why, why don't you go first, hello. Hi. Yeah. Well, no. So uh, I know Salesforce from from um, many years ago, and I remember when we considered implementing it. Our concern was, you know, it's only as good as the people who put the information into it in the first place. So, from a sales tool standpoint, I think it um, it is incredible potential, and the people who use it love it, and and it serves them well. What's interesting is my husband's actually a web developer, and his comment was. He loves Slack. He spends all day on Slack and he did not have as favorable a reputation or association with Salesforce and its tech ability. And I think from a sales and marketing standpoint, 
we're, as a sales and marketer, much more accommodating with tech and much less vocally critical of it. Whereas, uh, I guess I'm personally curious, how do you try and adapt to this new world where tech is going, you, you suddenly have developers who can be very critical of your actions, um, at least in the short term, I guess, ultimately you try and bring them on side, but it's, it seems like, you know, speaking of Microsoft earlier, the feeling is, well, from a tech standpoint, it's, it's impressive to business people, but for people who actually work in tech, they don't always love it so much. Yeah, but do you want to do you, do you want to sort of address that? Good luck. <laughs> yeah. um, well, first of all, um, you know the, the, the comment you made is only as good as the data you put into it. But that's true. Um, that's true of any system. Um, but most of the data is is drawn from systems. It's not from people sitting, um, you know, inputting numbers onto a, a spreadsheet. Um, it's 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 drawn out of multiple data sources and uh, and AI is added to it to 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 bring a, a degree of impartiality. So um, it's I think probably by the sound of it, it's developed a lot since uh, um, your husband uh, uh, had his experience of it. Um, I I challenge this sort of concept that somehow Slack is technology and Salesforce isn't. Um, you know, the, the underlying technology behind Salesforce would, would put it up there with the, the biggest tech leaders. You can't be number one in the world for enterprise software uh, and not have a strong uh, um, tech basis, um, and particularly amongst enterprise customers. So I would, I'm a little bit surprised by that. Um, in terms of the community, uh, I think one of the things that Salesforce has done that's extraordinarily smart. This is very much an open um, platform. Um, there are over 5,000 different applications that uh, have grown up and um, use the, the open APIs to create businesses. Um, and and um, so the benefits of, of the platform are shared amongst many. Um, you know, within the, the broader community, <clears throat> there are thousands of people who have developed skills of, uh, around using Salesforce um, that have made careers on the back of it in big companies and small companies. So I think um, you know, there's a lot that uh, understandably Mark is proud about in terms of how it has you know, created employment, created growth for not just uh, a few hundred or, or thousand people in Salesforce, but probably millions of people around the world. And I'm, I'm reminded, actually, I should say, Ramsey, I'm reminded one of my favorite columns uh, about business was written by Alan Corrin, who was, you know, was, was a Times columnist back in the day and was a sort of lovely writer. And when I think the Rousing family topped the Sunday Times rich list, he opened his column by saying, God, it's amazing how rich the Rousings are. Imagine how wealthy they'd be if it actually worked. And this was his point about if you don't remember the old Tetra Pak things that always spilt and ripped and opened. So there's a bit of that, I'm sure that you'll get it, you get as well, is that once you get into the game of uh, customer relationship marketing, the, the things want, people wanted to do almost everything. And, and in that spirit, I'm gonna bring my colleague, Fliss Demir, who's got a point about wh what she thinks would like to see um, Slack do next, Fliss, morning. Hello. Um, so I've just been thinking through um, how I actually use Slack and for me it's much more um, a communication platform and a sort of, as I see it, a dumping ground. So we've got these channels where, you know, ideas are kind of thrown in there. But for me that's kind of it. And I would hope that Salesforce would inject some of their CRM um, uh, uh, software into Slacks to make it a bit more intuitive so that you are extracting uh, key information in there from chats from you know oh, I've just found this really good article that can build uh, better profiles about your your sales targets or for us you know thinking experts you know we we're trying to reach quite a lot of people globally and it's no joke that you know knowledge is power is you know that's it's so important and all of these conversations are happening, but you know, 
having a place that's also free to capture all of this as a bridge towards a CRM system, um, yeah, that's probably what I would do. One thing I was going to say though about um, capturing this information that happens in the background and linking up between systems. So one of the things that we've come up against is, you know, we our sort of email system is all on Google, then we've got Slack, then we've got Microsoft. And some of those systems just don't talk to each other for obvious reasons, for commercial reasons. They want you to buy into their thing. But that's that's a barrier for particularly for a startup where you're trying to do things at breakneck speed for very little cost. Yes, thank you. Gavin, what will happen to Slack? Taking on Felicia's point, how will it change, do you think? Uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, it, it, if I look at uh, the product itself, I think it will continue to have a strong identity within within Salesforce. Um, we'll strengthen the integration into the existing Salesforce suite, um, but I think it'll have a strong standalone capability as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in terms of how we sell it and um, how we go to market, you know, one of the interesting things is Slack has grown up as a viral product. Um, it's, it's come from a sort of consumer background um, and the enterprise side of the equation is, is relatively underdeveloped um, and is, is, is almost, I would say, it's, it's an upsell from the, uh, the consumer side of the business or the, the sort of mass market side of the business. Um, I think that's, that's an opportunity for us going forward. So more actively, um, you know, pushing sales and distribution into the enterprise customer base, which is where Salesforce is particularly strong. Uh, Gavin, can I, I, I want to bring in a moment, if I might, John Zeely, who's talking about the way in which keep people market and the use of tech in that. And I want to go back to a point that Alan Greenberg made right at the start about skills. But before I do, I just want to follow up on one point you make about this Salesforce economy, you know, and, and Mark Benioff, you know, makes the claim that there are 4.2 million people, you know, forget the 54,000 people who work for scale Salesforce, there are 4.2 million people operating that Salesforce economy, you know, 5,000 or so companies built off the kind of ecosystem of Salesforce. And, you know, when I first thought about that, I was kind of amazed. And then I was worried. And, and the worry was this, that that what you're going to see, and we've seen it with Microsoft, we've seen it with Google, is that these clusters emerge around not necessarily the dominant service providers, but certainly the leading service providers. And there are two issues around that, it seems to me. One is that they're concentrated in certain places, possibly not the UK. And the other one is they become so big that there's a kind of um, th th there's a public policy, there's a regulatory pr problem. You're not just trying to manage an enormous smart business. You're trying to manage a whole ecosystem that frankly is beyond you. And I wonder what you think about that. The, the, the risk that the UK doesn't develop these giants and therefore doesn't have these ecosystems and the fact that governments just can't, can't manage them. Um, look, I, I think... Um responsible business and, and, and being conscious of unintended consequences of, of how you, you develop and grow your business is, is, is something every business leader needs to be paying attention to. Um, you know, misuse of, of your product, using it for ways that it isn't designed for is, is a big thing, for example, that a lot of tech companies are, are concerned about at the moment. Um, Salesforce is big and growing, but it's you know, it's, a, it's small in comparison to a Microsoft and a Google. So uh, I think we were talking about market caps being an example. Yeah, you know, Microsoft is one and a half trillion, I think. You know, Salesforce is 250 billion. Um, so there's some way to, to, to go. Um, if you look at market share, you know, micro, um, Salesforce is market leader in, in CRM, but it's, its market share is 20% of the market. Mm. So it is, it is a, it's a dynamic market. It's a competitive market. Um, you know, it's well uh, lower than uh, the sort of 40% threshold that uh, a lot of 
antitrust legislation is built around. And, and if I look at the market shares that uh, Google have, have reached or, or Microsoft reached with uh, operating systems, I mean, those are in the sort of 70, 80, 90s range. So it's, it's a long way from uh, that sort of number. Um, in terms of how you, you, you legislate, um, you know, uh, you know, I think the world needs to find a common set of, certainly the, the Western world, if you like, a common set of rules, regulations, taxation that ensures that there's, there is the right incentives in place, but the right protection in place, and that um, you know, countries try to converge on a, a common set of principles. Um, you know, if there's a balkanization of, of the internet, if, if, if countries begin to try and carve out too many of their own rules, mm. it'll be impossible to manage. Mm. Um, and companies will be effectively un, un, uh, unmanageable and uh, unfettered in terms of what they do. And, you know, I don't think that's a good outcome for, for anybody. So, uh, you know, from, from a government point of view, I would, I would argue governments need to try and align more consistently on, on what what good looks like and what things shouldn't be being allowed and 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 importantly i think how to tax these these types of businesses so just, and just just will you just touch on that gavin because the fact that you volunteered a point about tax actually i could work up this morning thought i've really got to get to tax with gavin Paston today your, your your feeling is that we'll, we'll just explain your feeling about salesforce's tax position versus someone like amazon's tax position um okay uh you know, I'm not going to get into a sort of personal critique or around uh, Amazon's tax position per se. Um, what I would say, James, is, uh, you know, big companies, in fact, all companies have a role to play in um, contribu contributing to uh, the tax coffers. Um, you know, uh, I don't criticize companies for trying to optimize their, their tax strategies. Um, you know, I think it is up to governments to 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 create simpler, um, you know, tax regimes to ensure that uh, those sorts of loopholes are, are avoided, um, and that the incentives to work around them simply aren't there. So I, my argument is try and create a more consistent tax policy um, uh, across the EU and across the US, and and some of these. Um, I would say loopholes will be, well, in fact, all the loopholes hopefully will be removed. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not in the business of, of saying Amazon's doing anything wrong per se. Um, what I am saying is, look, I think responsible business um, means paying tax um, and paying a fair share of tax. Um, and, um, but I think governments are critical in ensuring that you, you have the uh, a level playing field, if you like, to ensure that you can do that, and there isn't some sort of competitive advantage that is 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 won or lost because you base yourself in in one country or another. Can, can I just say to Gavin? It seems to me as though it is really important, and I appreciate it's difficult. You know, no one wins prizes in the business world for sort of pointing fingers or throwing stones at other companies, and yet the other at the, at the same time, the reality is, you know. This is an Amazon issue which affects the reputation of all other business, Silicon Valley businesses. Salesforce's effective tax rate is, is generously tenfold the size of Amazon's effective tax rate, right? So there is a, there is a um, I'm being generous by the way to Amazon rather than to Salesforce here, right? So I, I wonder what is the extent to which, and we've seen it with Facebook and social media regulation, that sooner or later, if the companies don't take a lead on that position, it, it, there's a backlash for the business in terms of regulation and public opinion. And so I just wonder whether or not there's something more muscular that you can do. In fact, I suppose I'm suggesting that you should do in terms of you know, forcing the position on tax. Well, I think, you know, you can try and do the right thing. You can try and um, uh, be an exemplar for responsible business. You can try um, building support at things like the CBI and the, the Business Roundtable in the US so that um, more CEOs, more business leaders see it as actually their 
their responsibility to ensure um, a, you know, there's a fair taxation system and companies pay uh, their fair share of tax. But beyond that, I, I, I don't think you know, um, Salesforce is in a position to, to lecture Amazon um, any, any more so than a, a government is. You know, I, I, I do think, James, that this, is, this has to start with governments. Right. Okay. Um, okay. No, I see. Create a framework, and there's there's been a lot of talk about this for uh, a long time. Really long time. I don't know. That I, much further than we were ten years ago, probably not. All right. Well, listen. I, I wanted. I said I wanted to just go back to um, John Zeely's point, which is which is an interesting one. I hadn't even uh, thought about, which was about about marketing and the extent to which we do or don't use tech in our marketing. John, are you there? Good morning. Yeah. Hi there. Hi, Gavin. How are you doing, hey, John? Good to see you again. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of uh, Dreamforce. I was lucky enough to be in the room with Obama and then Fleetwood Mac last year. So virtual isn't quite the same, but hey, there we go. I'm interested because you started off at Procter, as other people did on this call, and then you took BT into marketing. I mean, you're one of the poster child, if I can put it that way, for what marketeers can do and get to the senior levels of business with some success. And as Nick put in the chat, some risk, frankly. But you know, Salesforce is in a space which is more sales oriented, more process oriented, and traditionally marketers have looked rather askance at technology. They see it almost as a crutch for the weak, as opposed to you know the sort of inspiration. How are you going to bridge that gap? Because you potentially crossed over slightly to the dark side compared with much of your history to date. Um, I look. I, I, I'm sort of. Uh, I'm proud I started my career in, in marketing and um, a lot of how I think about things are through a marketeer's uh, prism, I guess. Um, but it isn't the only um, the only sort of uh, chapter of my career that I, I, I've drawn on. I'm a chemical engineer originally. Um, then I spent 10 years in marketing at, at Procter. But since 1999, I've been in telecoms, cable, technology, and, in, and probably more in general management and um, uh, general management roles. So uh, yeah, while I, I, I do undoubtedly try and look through a, a, um, a marketer's perspective uh, when, when making decisions, I don't think it's the only thing I, I take into consideration. I, I, I think I've seen different aspects of, of, of life as I've gone through it. And I, I don't particularly like to pigeon my whole that, pigeonhole myself that way. Um, the, the way I would look at it is um, when I sort of uh, finished my time at BT, um, actually deciding what to do next is, is, is not an easy decision. I'm sort of halfway through my life at this point. Um, and um, I want to something that's going to be interesting and challenging. And, um, you know, the, uh, the BT job is, is all of those things uh, all at the same time. Um, probably an element of um, impossible at the same time, I would say. But um, uh, you want to, like everybody, you want to feel as though you're moving forward in life, you're progressing. Um, and for a long time, I didn't actually think I was going to do another executive job. Um, but... Uh, so I was working a little bit with Salesforce um, on an advisory basis, um, and I found myself being drawn back into executive life. I found that I was missing the day-to-day -day cut and thrust of um, the operation. Um, and then, you know, this role opened up just at the right time. So it, it, it wasn't some part, part of some, you know, strategic plan, as it were, and, uh, you know, I find in life many, many things that sort of look um, interesting afterwards are often down to complete randomness. <laughs> um, and there is an element of that about this, but I'm, I'm enjoying the work. It's, you know, it's uh, a change is as good as a rest is, is, is probably the way I'd describe it. Um, so I am, you know, I'm in a very different market, very different company, um, very different culture as we've talked about. Uh, and it sort of, um, you know, it's it's it sort of rejuvenated me in many ways. And I, you know, that hunger for hunger for work, hunger for life has sort of come back, and um, and that's why I'm doing it. Um, so 
you know, um, dark side or not, um, it's it's an interesting job. And, um, you know, there's probably very few more exciting places to work uh, at the moment, um, I would argue, yeah. and, and yeah. that's a real privilege. John, John thank you. G Gavin, can I, can I uh, uh, very, very early on, Alan Greenberg um, raised a question about, well, I'm going to ask Alan to put it, because I'd like to talk a little bit about, you know, you say about planning, but how the country plans for the digital changes and the skills question seems to bedevil the UK. Uh, Alan, do, do you want to put your point or your thinking to, to Gavin? Thank you. Thank you, James. And Gavin, very nice to meet you. Um, yeah. Just to give you some context, um, I'm ex-Apple, I was Apple's education director for a number of years, but there's a number of things going on in Salesforce that I think are truly remarkable. And you mentioned or came up in the conversation as well about market share. And in a previous tortoise conversation, we've talked about impact, impact audit. And the audience might be interested to learn about something called the Salesforce Education Cloud, which in my opinion is probably the greatest disruption in the education sector that's been seen for the last 10 years. It reminds me of conversations we had back at Apple, which I could elaborate on if people are interested. But what you've recognized is you've recognized the student in and over and above the institution. So most education technologies are provided for institution application, but you through your CRM are recognizing the individual. So the individual student, many of whom now pay for their education, many of whom are um, distributed networks, whether that's kids working, uh, not able to go to school and being at home, whether that's university students not able to get to lecture hall or respectfully, whether that's enterprise and not necessarily turning from the office. So you sit in the sweet spot of providing the greatest disruption in education globally for the last 10 years. And I'm very interested to understand how you see that um, and certainly happy to discuss that. Alan, thank you, Gavin. Uh, well, thank you, Alan. <laughs> That's uh, a very um, kind um, introduction to it. Um, I think what, what I would say is that the What's clever about the, the underlying software is that you can apply it to different situations. Um, and um, I think what you're talking about there is, is a particular example of it. So earlier I talked about sales and um, managing a sales opportunity from through its if different life stages. Um, actually, you could take that concept and, and apply it to different situations. And education is just one of them where you can take take it from a, uh, you know, um, a student's view and, and manage their life stage um, all the way through education. Um, in fact, all the way through their lives. Um, you can do it with um, manufacturing um, and you can look at how something has been manufactured and each component of it, exactly where it has come from and, and, and the quality and, um, origin of, of, of each component of, of something that's been made. So the, the, the beauty of it is it's a very, very flexible system that can be applied to many, many different things. Um, it sits in the cloud, so it's easy to upgrade, provided that you don't customize it too much, of course. Um, and um, you know, if you create a, a single data set, you can, you can apply it in, uh, to all sorts of different applications. So, um, you know, education, I think, is ripe for uh, reinvention. Absolutely. I would say um, I think we're at the beginning of the journey, um, including uh, Salesforce's contribution to it. Um, but if I was to say where, where do I think the real growth areas are, education would be in you know, top three for me. Gavin, th thank you. Um, and, and Alan, one of the things we'll try to do is make sure we put people together because obviously I'd be interested to hear more about how you see this. One of the things that we've done at Tortoise is hold, as you know, these education summits and we're looking at some big questions for 2021 where we're going to try, Alan, to sort of take one subject at some length. One of them is the UK's next economic model to so try and think about how we address the skills problem. And another one is education for everyone and so really think about that beyond the institution so it'd be brilliant to hook up with you and talk about that talk about that further uh, i'm just going to bring in uh, my colleague tess murray and i want to go to austin lally before we're done tess are you there yeah Hello. hi morning hi tess um thanks for being with us gavin i was feeling like this is a cross between um 
being in the psychiatrist chair in an analyst presentation. I hope it doesn't feel like that at your end. Um, I just had a couple of questions, uh, oh God, thoughts, um, about the kind of post-COVID world that we're going to be living with in, in terms of the, well, the working culture, so the flexible working, obviously, which uh, your B2B and B2C customers are going to be so dependent on. And I read something this morning about COVID being compared to World War Three. And if we were looking at a kind of post-World War rebuild, you know, we would have been looking at rebuilding houses, roads, ports, you name it. And it strikes me that our kind of post-war rebuild is infrastructure in a completely different way. And one of those is our sort of tech and digital access infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And it's become increasingly obvious what happens if you're part of the sort of digitally dispossessed in the world and how much the recovery uh, you might miss out on. And I don't want to drag you back by your... I was going to say hair, sorry, <laughs> to the open reach. <laughs> so it's like, don't mention the wall, don't mention your hair. Um, uh, drag you back to the open reach debate. But the idea of sort of public service internet access seems to be really high on the agenda for our ability to rebuild in a way that doesn't exacerbate uh, gaps in society. I just, and that's what I was thinking about this morning the complete shift in working cultures and how we bring everybody back on the same track. Thanks, Tess. Gavin. Well, look, um, a couple of things I would say, Tess. I, I think you're absolutely right with the analogy. I think rebuilding the economy in a way that is more future-proof um, in terms of digital is fairer uh, in terms of the distribution um, uh, is, uh, has um, more equitable in terms of opportunities. Um, it doesn't uh, keep... Uh, uh, promotions and, and and jobs just for for the elite. These are all, I think, the sort of objectives we should set ourselves. You know, there's going to be a, a slew of investment that comes through, and I think the real opportunity is to build back different rather than build back the same. And um, I think business leaders, politicians, um, indeed the media, have a responsibility to ensure that the the investment is directed to to create a a fairer society and a better society. There's absolutely uh, spot on. Um, so I think if there's anything good to come out of COVID, I think that that's the good thing. And if you look at what happened after the war and how a lot of the investment was the World War II, a lot of the investment created infrastructure that created long-term growth. You know, the, the road network in the US is always the, the example of that. Um, then I think you can create, you know, in real in building back, you can create long-term durable fairer uh, society on the, on the back of it. Um, I think digital skills are, are fundamental. Uh, connectivity is, is part of that. There's no question about it. Um, but the, the, you know, how to, to fund, uh, you know, 10 to 20 billion of, of capital investment uh, and to put all the responsibility onto one company, um, you know, is, is a debate that uh, has been ongoing for probably 20, 30 years, and no doubt will continue to, to, uh, to go for the next uh, 10, 20 years. Um, what I'd focus in on is, is the skills agenda. Um, you know, there is still a, a woeful shortage of, um, of people with just basic digital skills. And I'm not talking about Fortran programming here. I'm talking about being able to, um, you know, feel comfortable doing basic low code um, development, uh, websites, apps, et cetera, being able to manipulate and present data. Um, and the ability to learn those skills is, is available to all today. Um, you know, Salesforce, for example, offers uh, an online uh, learning um, program called Trailhead, uh, where you can, you can learn how to, use Salesforce in all its various forms. And um, you can be an employee to do that, or you can be working one of our customers, or you can just be a member of the public. And, you know, you can do that and, and, and become accredited to a very, very high standard. And um, believe it or not, many, many people do, and they go on to become employees of the company. So I think there are, there are, there are ways of gaining the skills today that don't require government intervention that, um, that are available to all.
one thing, I'm going to I'm going to go to Tess Thans, and and I'm going to I'm going to go to Austin Lally in a moment. I I, I appreciate um, uh, Roslyn Singleton is saying I'd like to get back into you know, the circumstances of your leaving BT, Gavin. You may want to get back to that, but I'm just aware of time. I do want to just make one point to you, which is when I was at the BBC, I talked for a while about trying to create a scheme that we sort of called BBC Credit, where you would have lifelong learning through the BBC, where you would pick pick up these credits. And, and one of the things that's really hard is to take something that you described like trailhead right, and say, okay, well, the, the, the skills training is there, even the kind of modular approach to it is there, but how do we do the rollout? How do we make sure that it's, it's not something, it's something that's made not just accessible, but, but, but sort of marketable. And, I, and I'm really interested in that. Um, I, just, I just put that to you as a, as a, as a point of view. I want to I want to bring in Austin Lally um, just because he asked the question, which I'm also really intrigued by, which is about culture. Is Austin <laughs> be there? Hi, James. Hi, Gavin. Yeah, you. Hello, Austin. Um, How are you? I have to. I have to start with a kind of quick declaration of conflict of interests. Gavin and I, are old friends, former colleagues, and I'm a I guess a happy Salesforce customer on my French business, at Nice Installation, and uh, I guess I'll see you at Anfield right once the vaccine is better <laughs> distributed, Gavin. Um, but the, the topic I wanted to bring up is, is really culture and what you've kind of learned, I guess, now with your exposure to, you know, what's regarded as a highly successful, agile, modern, sort of flat, like West Coast culture and, and how you would contrast it, like back to, you know, call it traditional British business. Um, I mean, I've always wondered why the country, in a sense, lacked the innovation that it should have when it has such a, if you like, such excellence in the university system and you know what you have in the west coast in a sense are, are great schools but you have something else something on top which which i'm calling culture mm. you know and i'd love to have your sort of thoughts on that thank you Gavin. um what i would say um all great companies um in my opinion have very strong um consistent cultures um you know, the company that uh, Austin and I started at um, is an example of that, P&G. Um, you can usually spot somebody who's worked at P&G a mile off. Um, certainly you could in the, like, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and, uh, and, you know, Salesforce is, is, I think, has the same attribute. Um, Alan was talking about Apple. And, you know, it's, I think it's a very clear uh, point of differentiation for them as well. You know, if I look at what sets Salesforce apart, it's, you know, I would argue the technology is great. The products are, are, are very popular. There's a, an incredible sales machine. But the, the thing that really defines it is the culture. Um, and the culture allows it to continue to uh, uh, anticipate threats, reinvent itself, um, adapt to a different environment and, and remain on top. Um, you know, don't underestimate how difficult it is to continue to grow 20% a year in an environment where <laughs> it's probably the most dynamic and competitive environment you could possibly find in the world. So I, I, if you look at how Mark created the company, it really started on culture and the way he wanted to do things. Um, and then the technology came second. Um, and even today, um, you know, he spends a lot more time on culture than anything else, I would say. Um, I would also say to, to, to the wider point, Austin, um, this sort of uh, try and fail culture, you know, failure is encouraged in some ways, it's, it's welcomed, um, risk taking uh, is encouraged, um, people are expected to, um, to try things and fail and then, and then start again and it's not held against them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, people are prepared to take risks. They're prepared to break off and do different things. So, you know, I was talking about what the founders of, of Slack have, have done. Um, you know, this is their fourth startup in some ways. Uh, and the things that they were really passionate about didn't really go very far, um, even though they, in many ways, they were brilliant products. So, you know, that continuing uh, that, that desire to continue to experimenting, the encouragement of failure, um, the uh, the desire to really make your 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 name, 
you know, this, this concept of investing in people who've left you. I mean, when was the last time you heard that? Uh, certainly at Proxa, you were, you were dead to Proxa if you were ever dead to leave it. Um, yeah, it's, it's not the way in, in Silicon Valley, I, I would say. So, but it is a different environment. I think it's a different culture um, more broadly um, that, is in, that in, encourages innovation and encourages experimentation. Gavin, thank you. And, and Austin, thank you. Thank you, too. I, I, I'm aware of the time of people having to get on with their, their day. But, but Gavin, I just want to say thank you for sparing an hour to, to join us and talk through these things in detail, because, you know, uh, as with a normal editorial meeting, I just wanted to pull away from it and just say what what's something I felt I'd learned. And I'd learned sort of two really broad things. One is this point about culture and business. I do think we have to take to heart some of the things that you say, and you and you went through them quite sort of, you know, casually and easily, but they are massive challenges to the way that certainly big companies in the UK are working, you know, Salesforce being run by 10 people, you know, the, this, this kind of focus on the customer, everything you see in Dreamforce, the very kind of CRM notion itself starts with this, with the customer, um, the point you made about single stack development, and, and I suppose more than anything, you, know, you may use this phrase about Salesforce being functionally organized. I think lots of people will say, oh, yes, well, I recognize my company being dysfunctionally organized, you know, <laughs> and organized not by function. But then I think there's a second tier of the things that you talked about, which probably are going to be at least one of the main streams of what we discuss next year, which is how does how do we create a world of smart machines and software for the public good? And so tax obviously sits in that, data sits in that. But I think the point you made about you know, this, this Salesforce economy, the cluster, the capacity to invest in businesses that live alongside yours, all of those go to this uh, UK competitiveness question and central to the point you made are the points that came up through you, through uh, Alan and others around digital skills. And so I hope that we will really begin to understand that and rather than do what feels as though being done for 10 years, sort of admire the problem, be able to come away in the course of next year with some ideas of what we could do next. But as a way of uh, thinking about business and the world at the end of 2020, it's been really brilliant listening to you. So thank you for joining us. Thank you to everyone for, uh, for sparing us the time this morning. Uh, and I hope you all have a very good day. Um, please give Gavin uh, a welcome uh, wave goodbye. Thanks very much indeed.